Chapter 10, The Second Journey Chuma awoke in the shade of a spreading acacia tree, his flowers giving a sweet smell to the warm air. Faces etched with concern were staring down at him. He looked from one to the other, the doctor, his clothes still dripping wet. With Katani and all six porters, everyone had survived. How did I get here? All our canoes were lost except one, thank God, said the doctor. With it, some of the men were able to come over and take us off that island. Chuma sat up, but quickly wished he hadn't moved. Ooh, his back burned like fire. I want to thank you. You saved my life at a great risk to yourself. But, the doctor said as he turned Chuma to look at his back, I'm afraid I lost all my medicine and have nothing to put on those scratches on your back. Looks like you tangled with a lion, he chuckled. I think it was just a river, but it almost won, said Chuma. Well, I think you'll be all right until we get something for it, but we'd better get going if you feel well enough to walk. It's going to take another full day or maybe even longer to get back to the mission station. In the days and weeks that followed at the mission station, Chuma and Wikitani often worried about what the Manganja warriors had said about their village. What if our families are all dead, as that Manganja said? said Wikitani one day. Both boys had been afraid to put their worst fears into words. Chuma thought for a long time. When he broke the silence, there were tears in his eyes. If they are, I will stay with the doctor and be a Christian. But we do not know that. We cannot give up hope. Besides, said Wikitani, the Manganja liked to boast. He was just trying to scare us. But we must go back and let our families know we are alive. It was only a couple of days later that Livingston called the boys to him while he was sitting outside his tent studying his maps. I have heard reports of another lake to the north of your homeland. It is said to be very, a very great body of water. Do you know of it? He said, looking up at the boys standing beside his table. Chuma shrugged, but Wikitani said, I have heard of it. It is called Nyasa. Yes, Lake Nyasa, mused the doctor, pulling at the corners of his mustache. Have you ever seen it? No, doctor, but my father has. He has? Did he tell you anything about it? Only that it is very, very long. One old man told him that if you started as a boy, you'd be an old man when you before you finished walking around it. Really? He said it, but everyone else laughed and said it would take two months to walk around it. But it can't be done. Why not? I don't know. That's still pretty big. I must explore this Lake Nyasa. It may be the key to stopping the slave traders. The boys did not understand. You see, the doctor continued, punching a point on the map with his finger, if we could get a steamboat onto Lake Nyasa, we could bring in the supplies and people to set up a mission station there. I could claim that part of the country for England, and it would be out from under the control of the Portuguese slavers. Then we could be a much more effective in stopping this terrible slave trade. But doctor, said Chuma, how would you get your steamboat beyond the rapids? David Livingston shrugged. That's why I must explore the lake. If it's as big as you say, then it has to have another outlet besides the Shire River. Livingston got up and started pacing around his camp, slamming his right fist into the palm of his left hand with each step. He whirled and pointed at Wikitani. Did your father say anything about a river running out of the lake to the east, all the way to the sea? No. Well, there must be one, and I will find it. The whole geography of the region demands one. As the boys left the doctor's camp, Wikitani turned to Chuma and said excitedly, Did you look at the doctor's map? Yes. What about it? We could not get home from the south because of the terrible fighting between us and Lake Sherwa, but what if we approached Lake Sherwa from the north? There might not be so much fighting up there. Right, said Wikitani eagerly. If we could go on this expedition with Dr. Livingston, we could travel up the Shire River around all the fighting to Lake Nyasa to the north. From there interrupted Chuma eagerly as he saw the plan. We could come down to our homeland. What do you think? Is it going to work? The boys had to do some fast talking, but three days later they were again part of the doctor's expedition. They did not, however, tell him their real hopes for wanting to go along. The Murchison cataracts that began just above the mission station on the Shire River did not allow for any boat travel. So the four porters carried a four-oared rowboat as they headed north along the west bank of the river. Two more men went ahead and cleared the way with machetes. 
Livingston preceded them, trying to scout out the easiest path, which was never very easy, as they were always going steeply uphill. Chuma and Wikitani followed, loaded down with the heavy oars, the sail, and an awning. When we get on that lake, we'll be glad for this sail, said the doctor had said, and the awning will protect us from the sun day after day. When the men were exhausted, they put the boat down and everyone got a rest, if you could call it that, while all but two left as guards, hiked back to pick up their supplies. Then everyone hoisted boxes and bundles onto their backs and carried them up to the point where they had left the boat. Then they did it all again. On a good day, this routine was reported, repeated three or four times. Along the way, the boys marveled that they had ever tried to come down the river in canoes. Often they would hike for miles along the top edge of a deep gorge with the raging river at the bottom and no shore at the water's edge where they could have sought safety or taken a rest. Once Livingston showed the boys the map. The Murchison cataracts on the Shire River are 40 miles long. I think the Lord God was protecting us by getting us out of that river as quickly as he did, the doctor admitted. Soon they passed the point where their canoes had come out of the small river onto the Shire. But it took a total of three weeks of torturous work portaging the rowboat overland before the party arrived at a point where they could safely put it in the river. Having finally arrived at calm water, they took a day to rest, hunt for fresh meat, and prepare the, for the next leg of their journey. Travel on the river the next day was a pleasant relief from the constant toil of carrying their heavy loads uphill. The water was relatively smooth, and their rowing, while hard work, made good progress. Along the rapids, they had not seen any signs of the tribal war. But that day in the rolling hills to the east, a great pillar of black smoke rose high into the silvery sky. Since the area was mostly green jungle, it did not seem likely that the fire was accidental, but probably a village that had been put to the torch. That night they camped at the base of a cliff in a damp, marshy area. No fires tonight, said Livingston. We don't want to attract any attention. Later, as everyone slapped at the mosquitoes that would not let them eat in peace, Chuma decided it was time to bring up their plan. Dr. Livingston, when we get to Lake Nyasa, won't we be almost straight north of Lake Sherwa? Almost, Chuma. Why do you ask? Wikitani and I were thinking that it might be safe to travel to Lake Sherwa if we came down from the north since the battles we ran into were south of the lake. The doctor sat silently for a few moments, a deep frown creasing his forehead as he pulled at his mustache. It might be possible, he finally agreed, but here we are almost straight west of Lake Sherwa and we saw that burning village today. So the fighting's not only in the south, but why do you ask? We were wondering, jumped in Wikitani, whether you got that far north, whether when you got that far north, you might decide to go south to meet the Ajawa chiefs. And you could take us with you to find our families, added Chuma. Livingston got up and walked down to the water's edge. The boys did not know whether he was angry or not. Finally, he strode back to the rest of them. I had hoped to bring a quick end to this fighting by trying to reach the Ajawa chiefs, he explained, but we failed. Since then, I've come to feel that God has a larger purpose for me. I believe we must establish a mission, mission base in the interior. It's the only way to break the back of this wicked slave trade. But you wanted to stop the war, remember? said Chuma. Yes, and I would still give my life to accomplish that. But I must not be short-sighted. I do not know how much longer the Portuguese will allow me to remain in this part of Africa. We must establish a permanent base farther north, around Lake Nyasa, and the only hope is to find a waterway from it to the sea. Then I can get a steamboat with supplies into the interior. All the porters were quiet and listening intently. You see, as terrible as this tribal war is, Livingston went on, there is a more serious mission. The bishop and others like him want to bring the gospel, the story about God's son Jesus, to all these tribes. Jesus showed people a new way to live with one another. He forgave his enemies. He showed that everyone, old and young, men, women, and children, black and white, is important to God. Most important, Jesus died to take the punishment for our sins so that all of us can live with God in heaven forever. No one spoke. 
this was something to think about. You see, the only real way to stop the slavers and the fighting is to change people's hearts. If the people hear the gospel, maybe they will obey God's commandments and stop warring with one another and selling people into slavery. Livingston looked kindly at Chuma and Wikitani. I'm sorry, my young friends. I must try for the greater purpose first. We must go on to Lake Nyasa and find the river to the sea. Then maybe we can make another attempt to reach the Ajawa chiefs.